Hey, I'm Bill with Lost in the Ozarks. Gary's running the cameras, and we're here today in Eureka Springs with Steve Arnold, world famous meteorite hunter, and unlike me, meteorite finder. Well, for a little while. <laughs> One day we're going to get you. Okay, and local entrepreneur for Eureka Springs. Yes. Steve, always a pleasure to see you. Great to see you. Wanted to ask you about a few of the meteors that have been, meteorites that have been found in this area, uh, starting with Arkansas. Uh, okay. What are, what's, would you say is the most famous one as far as people well, think? Well, fame is, is, is quite relative depending on what happens and when. Uh, two really stand out for Arkansas. Uh, what, one is the Cabin Creek. It is uh, arguably one of the most uh, beautiful meteorites in the world. I, mm -hmm. I would rank it in the top two or three aesthetically gorgeous meteorites. Uh, it's an iron meteorite. Uh, it, it has a shield shape to it and it's just incredible, okay. incredible. It's over in Vienna. And, uh, but uh, it, was, it was found south of Eureka Springs and there was a period of time when it came up here and one of the stores here in Eureka had it on display, uh, possibly the newspaper, I'm not sure where, but uh, there, I know there was it, was, it was here for a couple months before it made it, its way on out. Oh, so, that'd be nice to still have around here it, even. It yeah. would be real nice to have, but uh, I don't think it's gonna be going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, so. don't, don't, yeah. And uh, the other, uh, kind of on the other side, the Paragould, Arkansas, um, I've thrown the argument out that it's the most important meteorite fall of all time. Mm -hmm. And that always will, will generate uh, arguments from like, well, how can you say that? And mm -hmm. a lot of people aren't even aware of the Paragould. But right. in 1930, uh, the a fireball landed, it was January of 1930, came in and exploded near Paragould and broke into um, at least a few pieces. And mm -hmm. there was uh, an 80 pound piece found and an 820 pound piece mm -hmm. found. And the 821, um, Harvey Neininger was in uh, yeah. um, McPherson, Kansas. He was mm -hmm. teaching there. He heard about the fireball. So, So this is like, a month or two after the stock market crash of 1929. Okay. And uh, it's, it's interesting. I've been to Paragould. I've gone to their library. I like to do research in case there's someone, you know, will will be interviewed in a newspaper about finding one. And, and it maybe did. it's still with the family or something. Gotcha. And uh, I, I'm sitting here reading, you know, the headlines and the politicians are going, oh, this, this recession is just short. We're going to be coming out. And I'm going, no, no, don't listen to them. It's going to last for 10 years. It's going to be horrible. And then there's going to be a world war. It's going to be 20 years. Before. Don't listen to Washington when they say it's going to be, yeah. it, it's going to be a quick recovery. It's like, no, no. So. So maybe my cynicism even it, it, okay. <laughs> carries forward to today. But what happened was um, Harvey Neininger uh, was, was fascinated. In 1923, he saw a meteorite fly over him in, in McPherson, and he decided I, he, had, he, he was a teacher, and he had chalk in his pocket, and on the sidewalk, he marked the direction it flew, and he ah. goes, I'm going to go find it. Gotcha. Well, he went on an effort to try to find it, and he never did. Uh, but he turned up two new meteorites, oh, okay. and it, the quite easily uh, down near uh, cold water, Kansas, and so it it that got his journey started. Well, seven years later, this one lands over in Paragould, and he borrowed something like three thousand dollars, which in a lot of money back then, a lot yes. of money. Uh, from a banker and or or maybe it was a financer, but uh, a, a private. But he he borrowed the money, he bought the meteorite, and he flipped it a couple weeks later to the Field Museum in in Chicago, and he doubled his money. Ooh, so okay. he's able to pay it back, and he had a profit, and so yeah, yeah, like essentially 
a you know a couple years worth of salary exactly back in those and days. it gave him the courage to quit teaching, teaching. Okay. and go into meteorites full time and apparently he was reading some of those headlines saying that the economy was going to get back real quick <laughs> he doesn't need that tenured salary right i'm going to go out on a, as an entrepreneur and he went on to find over 600 meteorites Ooh, and okay. was co-founder of the meteoritical society and he's kind of our patron saint right and yeah. so it's like if paragould had not happened he would not have had the nest egg to quit and go full time oh, okay. and probably would have been stuck teaching through the great depression and the whole history of meteorite hunting and would have probably been way behind or yes. slowed down okay so I understand so historically you know some of these meteorites they're they're rare in their type and they have a scientific value and others have the cultural value and then there's overlapping on that so. gotcha and the three major types are iron stony iron and um, stone, stone. Yep. Oh, okay yep. all right and then like some of them are LL classified, that's the iron content, or what, how does it? Right, so you, you, have, uh, you have the stone, the iron, and stony iron. And stony irons are usually about 50% metal and um, a stone in, mm -hmm. in the composition, often from collisions in space. You have, uh, of the stones, uh, you'll still have iron in them. Usually, 5% don't have any metal in them, but 95% of the stones do have some metal in them, um, and some sometimes significant. Enough a metal detector will detect them, and enough that they'll attract to a magnet. Mm -hmm. And so, um, with it, there's there's quite a few different uh, types of stone, and essentially, when it comes to classification, scientists pretty much want to identify what the parent body, body was. Right in space. So if it came from the moon, they're lunars. If it came from the planet Mars, they're Martian. There's, um, Vesta yeah. is, mm -hmm. is a really popular, I say popular, about 5% of, of our meteorites come from Vesta. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it's still there. Now, some of the other, um, asteroids, uh, the parent bodies are not Probably, intact. Yeah. Destroyed, broke right. to pieces and collisions. And some of those pieces make their way to okay. Uh, well, Gary and I, are, of course, grew up near Slovak, Arkansas. Right. That was just found by a farmer and was an iron meteorite, if I remember. No, it's it's a stone so meteorite. Yeah, okay. It's, All right. Yeah, it's a stone meteorite. Oh, okay. I and it's got some metal in it, but it's mostly uh, a silicate uh, a composition. Oh, okay. Great. And uh, yeah, just I, I believe it was, you know, it's not uncommon. Yeah, well, for Arkansas, it is a little bit. First of all, we don't have that many farms, especially in in the north, know, right, north. Right, about half the half the state uh, is is pretty rough terrain, yeah. which makes makes the farming tough. Um, but uh, and then also Neininger didn't he he canvassed a lot of Kansas and Colorado and Nebraska and Texas and Oscar Monig was out of Fort Worth and he did a lot of education back in the 30s and 40s in, in the farming areas okay. of Texas. And so to get through eastern Kansas and get through western Arkansas to get yeah. to <laughs> where um, there's a lot of farmland and there should be a lot of meteorites waiting to be found. And of course, nowadays it's uh, farming is considerably different than it, it was when you were b walking behind a mule yeah. or on a small tractor. Now I just about have to break a display for you to notice anything in right. those big tractors or anything. Right. I wish I wish we'd known more about meteorite hunting when we were growing up down there because that land down there, if you see a rock, it was brought in. Right. They're yeah. not naturally forming down there. And, and, and you go back a couple generations and some of those old timers could spot an arrow point from oh, 100 feet away. You got you know? it. Yeah. And so their eyes were, were trained Maybe. to look for something a little different. And meteorites, of course, are a little different. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Fayetteville, was that a witness fall here in Arkansas? Fayetteville, it flew over this building. Okay. And uh, landed uh, in, uh, there were two rocks found over near uh, Fayetteville, one a little bit to the north and one um, uh, a little bit to the west of the campus. Oh, so, okay. 
Um, I know why I say a little bit west. I'm, I'm thinking um, the the uh, Golden Corral is real close to where one is. Okay. Yeah, and right. then there, uh, so if, if anybody's uh, kind of eating not, at the Golden Corral, keep your eye open if they're digging. Right, yeah. Right. <laughs> and which is just uh, to the north of the mall over there. And mm -hmm. then the, the other farmland. And the one, the first one that was found in the farmland, the cows uh, discovered it. Uh, oh. There was a, a rancher that came out and noticed all the cows' butts were like in a big asterisk. Uh -huh and their noses were sniffing this hole in the ground. And they're where, curious, so if there's something new and different, they did, okay. Yeah, yeah. so we walked over to see what it was, and there was a little hole, and it was it was sitting down in it. A oh, neat. Nested in it, it's a little. Well, that's crazy. cool. Yeah, that's, that'd be nice to find. All right. Uh, all right, let's talk about Ozarks in Missouri okay. meteorites. Which in Missouri would you say would be one of the most famous, or oh, the impact of the car, of course. Yes, but that's St. Louis. Yeah. Uh, I forget the year on it. It was in the early forties. Okay, forty-one. I'm not sure. Uh, there was a, a a car driving down the road, and the meteorite went through the roof of it and uh, ended up on the floorboard in the back seat. So just missed the driver by inches. Woo. Right. And um, so that. Uh, is is no doubt the most famous. Did they keep the car. No, I, I mean yes, it was still kept driving, but but it wouldn't. It did not become a desired artifact enough where nowadays somebody, though it oh, would probably yeah, yeah. yeah. definitely right. okay. There would definitely be people that would pay good money for that. I keep praying, hit my jeep, please hit my jeep. I'll sell it in the meteor as a package. There deal. you go. <laughs> Crater on wheels. Exactly. Right? And I think the uh, the peak scale meteorite mm -hmm. uh, is this probably graphically the great example of, of, of a big football sized meteorite just smashing a car the, in the, the trunk. So yeah, didn't it, they think somebody had broken it had vandalized it for a minute <laughs> or two. Yeah, like wait a minute. <laughs> All right. So something's not right here. Yeah. Uh, we talked about earlier before we started the Baxter meteor. Mm -hmm. which rained down rocks on a family that was, uh, one hit their house and, and... And and that's all we know of for sure. Okay. Um, now, there's, when you get eyewitnesses, some things are, are misreported. They're yes. misremembered. Now, the, the challenge with, was, with Baxter was it, Nightingale found out about it 10 or 12 years after it had happened. In fact, right. So there was another fall up at Archie, Missouri, mm -hmm. and it got a lot of media exposure, and a piece of the Baxter meteorite ended up in the mail to Nininger in Colorado. So when a fireball would happen, he would tell people to look for pieces. Mm -hmm. And then he also would manipulate the media a little bit yeah, that yeah. that maybe other you know other farmers if you've run into a meteorite yeah, you know this is what you're looking for obviously the witness ones are fresh and so their crust will be more black and not rusting but so it wasn't uncommon for new meteorites to turn up after big fireballs and and apparently it was news in the Baxter area, and it was like, hey, Ma, go get the rock that, you that, know, went okay. through the roof, right. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't a big deal to these people. It was very isolated. Um, it, the, the part of the Ozarks there at that time would have just been horrendous to get to. It's now, the, the foundation of the house that was hit is underneath. The lake, isn't it? Under, Table Rock? Yes, yeah. underneath Table Rock Lake. So, you know, and of course, Branson has all the nice roads and highways yeah. going into it now, so it's a whole lot easier to get to. Yes. Back in the 30s, it was not so easy to Some get Some of these to. hollows are, yeah, that's a pain to get, yeah. So people stayed there and he didn't get out there. And so, um, th so there were reports of other uh, rocks falling and it's possible. So um, we, we're not There were sure. multiple sonic booms, which is a good Indicate. sign. But then again, sonic booms can echo. Yeah, and so one that. sonic boom can sound like a couple. So we gotcha. don't know for certain. But as far as, and I think also, you know, you go around and you try to 
get the other neighbors to look 10 years later, it's kind of like, yeah, you're weird. Yeah, <laughs> back in those days, it would. Yeah, Even today, you run into that, I'm sure. You do, when you, yeah. What do you mean you're looking for a rock? Yeah, <laughs> and I got you. Definitely. Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, yeah, and I witness, like you say, they're just, you know, sometimes you're facing the direction you're not thinking you're facing, and you report right. the wrong. And like you've said many times, it fell right over there. No, it fell 300 miles back there. And, right. And, and the sonic boom is pretty good. You've got, um, if, you know, it's usually within if about they hear the sonic miles. boom, yeah, you're getting closer, I would imagine. Okay. Uh, Steve is from Kansas, of course, and it seems to be a lot of meteors are found. Isn't that the leading? Well, yeah, the, especially in the western part of Kansas, more, more meteorites per Any mile. reason for that? Uh, there's, well, it's not that different than eastern um, um, Arkansas. You've got a lot of farmland. Uh, you have so, no natural rocks. So if you hit a rock, it's... You need to look to see if, why. A Native right. American brought it in or did it fall from the sky? Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, that explains And so, and then and meteorites also were um, used as as tools. For right. Weighing down plows yeah. uh, to, to holding... Uh, roofs on chicken sheds. Probably the heaviest thing around. when Door the, stops, yeah. that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So uh, there was a period of time when uh, there was there was the notices that were were information in farming journals or in newspaper mm -hmm. stories or there would be lectures. People would come in and talk about meteorites and and what oh. to look for in sometimes school classes. And so oh, hey. it... Okay. it, it it, it was a novelty, and you know, meteorites were there. Were, there's always been a, a financial reward. Right. Um, uh, different times, a little bit more than others, um, more so now. But but even then, you know, if someone's going to give you five bucks for a rock, it's that like, you found, yeah, you might as well do, yeah. And then there's the nice feeling that you're contributing something to science. So, yeah. and there was, or or even if it was a little bit more money, if someone was yeah. paid fifty or a hundred dollars, that's quite a bit yeah. of money um, w with inflation now. Um, going back, that's enough that people will talk about. You know, in the cafes and diners, well, did you hear about Joe? He got a hundred yeah. bucks for his rock. <laughs> yeah. He drug around on his plow for for ten years. Year. Yeah, it, yeah. And then of course, like you say. Science is able to figure out more of the solar system by looking into these. So you've got that. That's nice to find the right. meteorite. And mm -hmm. then the collectors, like you say, shape, rarity, right. hitting something, a hammer stone, sure. all makes a difference. You know, you go into Kansas, and and I, it's every every county has a little county museum. Okay. And so they, and often it's, it's, this is native points and scrapers and spearheads and right. because that's what's been collected and it's part of their history and people die and leave it to the county museum or donate it. And so meteorites will often end up, you know, there over time. And so okay. it's just, it's uh, getting the word out. All right. Uh, now let's, uh, oh, do you, you can get people some parts of these meteorites if they're interested in collecting them in Arkansas, Missouri, the Ozarks, right? There are. Um, uh, different ones become available. I do have a, a few in my inventory. Uh, depending on demand, uh, I can go get them. You know, right. uh, one of the nice things, you would never take a, a $20 gold piece and cut it in half. Right. Or uh, Rembrandt and cut 10% yeah. off and sell yeah, it right. or donate 10% to a museum. But with meteorites, the, the real value in them is the information they contain. Mm -hmm. And the information can be gleaned from even a, a small oh, piece. Right. So it, it, and, and this, it's a lot cheaper and easier to ship a piece of a meteorite halfway around the world then, yeah. To ship the scientists halfway around the world mm -hmm. to study it. Gotcha. So uh, the protocol in science is that they, they chop them up. They cut them up and, yeah. and museums will say, well, well, I'll trade you 50 grams of this for 50 grams of that. And they'll go, okay. And now they both have... Some of the... Right. right. And, okay. And, and that's healthy also. Sometimes museums burn or we'll have a some, war yeah. or some, um, one gets blown up and... If, if everything is held in one place, 
then it, there's a subject. Exactly. Yeah, or subject some university or has a new testing protocol and finds something new or something. So it's nice to have it, I guess, scattered where they can actually yes. look at it. So um, to start with, few institutions, museums or research facilities are are interested in all of a meteorite. Right. Yeah, if, if a little chunk or a slice will do them well, they, they, they would rather just acquire um, a, something small. Mm -hmm. And so they'll trade a piece of this for that. Okay. And so if, if people are interested. Now, I had for four years the only brick and mortar meteorite store in America. Here in Eureka Springs, Here in exactly. Eureka. So I focused a little more on acquiring meteorites from Arkansas, Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, and Kansas because that's where our tourists um, would come in from. And people were more interested in getting a rock from their own Home location, location. Exactly. which is a little odd. You would think, well, you come to Arkansas, you want a, a quartz crystal, you know, or an Arkansas diamond, because yeah. you're, but when it comes to meteorites, it'd be like, yeah, I don't care about Arkansas. You got one from, from Kansas, and I'm from Kansas. Okay, I'll, I'll buy that one. Maybe it's because they're a little rarer than most things. And yeah, I, I think just people people are are self centered and <laughs> or or if they're buying them as a gift to oh, someone that's else, it yeah. doesn't you know okay it doesn't it, it it maybe has a little more meaning and of course you know each as as we're um, so vividly expressing here. Uh, each meteorite has a story, and some are a little more colorful, a little yeah. more interesting, and that, at, you know, the, the story is the same, whether it's a little piece or a big piece. Right. Yeah, but, but economically, if someone's got 10 or $20 in their pocket, it's, it's easier for them to get, get something it. little uh, than something big. Yeah, look at the one in Russia. It's like, yeah, this is the one that blew the windows out of, this piece is one of the, the big one that blew the windows out of mom and dad's house that year. And right, exactly. So, you know, I, I had someone contact me this last week that um, acquired in, uh, I, I think he bought it, um, uh, about uh, a kilo, and it's pretty thick slice. It's an iron meteorite uh -huh. from here, uh, Calico Rock here in Arkansas. Oh, okay. And uh, I have never seen it available before. Uh, it doesn't mean it hasn't been, um, but I've I've never acquired it or, okay. or whatnot. And so, um, boom, he was like, well, do you know anyone in Arkansas Center? So I said, you know, I wish there were more big time collectors from Arkansas. <laughs> and um, and it's a it's a rare type of an iron, which is is kind of interesting. So it, it probably will have a little more demand. I see that. When I still see the date, is it the one that is it part of the one that's a known fall from there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it is. So it was a, a find. It was not. Oh, a right. Yeah. Fall. It was a find. Uh, it just doesn't say when they found it. Right. When I looked over some notes. Okay. Well, cool. So. Yeah. You know, yeah, and then I've got, like I said, I've got some others in the inventory. So I've I've tried to acquire some, some of those up. for the the store in there. Oh, okay. Well, let's speaking of you had a brick and mortar store here. Now you have a new business here, or not a new business anymore. It's five years into it. Yeah. The uh, ghost tours, Honey Eureka. So, how are you reopening with the? COVID. I know you've started the walking tours and taking right. safety, but you're hoping to get everything up and running or how are you, what are your plans on? Well, as the, uh, the, the virus started to spread, um, people were um, a, a little apprehensive about uh, crowding into a, uh, a small shuttle bus. And that was our focus is we had uh, we started the the business with a shuttle bus, right. and we would take people around town, on and off several different places. Mm -hmm. And we have a fascinating town with some really great stories. Exactly. And and so it it made for a really uh, interesting thing. Now over time, we also added a walking tour. Mm -hmm. It's uh, with a little less overhead, so the price is a little lower and. And it was a little easier. Now the problem with walking tour is bad weather. It's a little bit tough. Yeah. And we are a, a year round concern. So as the virus was, was, was kicking in, people's paranoia of wanting to get on the van 
kept them from wanting to do that. Oh, but people okay. kept buying the walking uh, because tours, they could yeah. be out in the open and, and they, they could have, stay apart. Right. Okay, great. So as we're now reopening, we're, we're reopening with the walking tour okay. as well. And I, I'm not sure when people are going to be comfortable again on getting on a bus. Um, I, I think there's actually probably some legal problems with it at, temporarily. Right. Um, so, and even if there isn't, if no one buys tickets, then it's it doesn't matter. Yeah. Do. So we're we're in the walking tour only mode okay. right now, and so we've uh, done three already in the last week and a half. Good. And so um, this is a, usually a bit of a lull until. Uh, Memorial Day. Anyway. Right. This is iffy weather this time of year and kind of right. anyway for this. Okay. But uh, we have access into the underground catacombs and we're just a, a few feet away from, from, from them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that is the conclusion of the tour. And so it, it's we're, we're walking around downtown uh, hearing some of the better stories. And uh, it's a stroll, really. It's not, right. you don't break a sweat by, by any means. You walk for three minutes, stop for five or 10, walk for two, okay. stop for five or 10. So, um, but we do conclude a, a couple of our locations and where we talk about, uh, it, it does talk about the tunnels. Mm -hmm. And so people start to uh, the, get this the, vision in their mind, painting a picture of what the corridors, what we affectionately call the catacombs, uh, uh, the uh, what it's about, and so yeah. at the end being being able to go into them, and and uh, we have the best preserved, uh, biggest stretch of the tunnels oh, yeah, okay. in cool. town, and so we're at the end we're able to social distance and just let one group, one family, or one couple. That's what I was going to ask. Is that you're limiting how many people yeah. come in here, so you just stagger that out. That's good. Yeah. And your tour, there's a lot of history involved in your okay. tour. So, yeah, so even if you're a skeptic, you'd still really enjoy his tour because you'll learn a lot of the history of Eureka, and Eureka's got some crazy stories in it. It it's, is a, it's a fascinating town, and yeah, some of our best uh, five-star reviews, uh, I don't even believe in ghosts, but man, this was really interesting, and okay. so we're proud of that. I think, you know, uh, having been on television, yeah. I've I've learned to, to appreciate and enjoy this role of storytelling, exactly. and that is what happens uh, the the with with meteorite men, and yeah. so for me personally, the greatest joy I have is when I take somebody out and I help them find their first meteorite. There's yeah. there's nothing on earth that that. I can makes believe that. Me yes, I can and so there's that's my passion, and I I love finding them, but <laughs> I really like being there when someone else. It's like finds taking it. your kid and he catches his first fish. It's that feeling when it is. Yeah, it really is. And so I've been fortunate to do. I I'm I'm a, over a hundred people that I've been able to help Ooh. do that. And so when it comes to ghosts and spirits, mm -hmm. there's. Ironically, I don't know what's what's crazy about our society, but there's more people into ghosts and spirits than they are into meteorites. And you know I what? Understand. It's a lot easier to 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 help people on a nightly basis. And so yeah. maybe it's not quite as rewarding on my part mm -hmm. if someone captures an orb or they see something or something strange happen, which is fun. It yeah, is exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, what is this? It's a question, it's, yeah. But just like meteorites, you can't guarantee someone's gonna find a meteorite. Mm -hmm. We can't guarantee someone's gonna find a ghost. See something that can't ex be explained immediately, right. Mm -hmm. Speaking of your ghost tour and everything, in Eureka Springs, What's Eureka doing to open back up? Eureka is 100% uh, tourism. Uh, as, I mean, of course, we have our government and, and um, that's here, but we, we have no other industry other than tourism. And so uh, legally, uh, many things have been required to shut down and we are now reopening, I believe Friday, uh, is when the hotels are able to open. Um, to out-of-state people. Right. So right now, the in-state people can can come back, and uh, the restaurants, there's some limited seating, but uh, 
they're relaunching again this weekend. So things are opening up. And mm -hmm. so um, we are hoping there will be some people that want to come down. It's, it's a little bit of a tug war. Do we really want tens of thousands of people to show up? Uh, no, probably not, but we do want our businesses to survive. Uh, right. So it's, yeah. And so uh, everybody just obey the rules, social distancing and yeah. keep everything safe and just, yeah, just Eureka's too nice of a town to stay down. So Right. And we're out, you know, it's open air for much of it. A lot of people do like to stroll around from the different springs, from business to business. And yeah, so, there is a lot of outdoor activities in Eureka, which yeah. makes for a much different environment than going to a mall or somewhere where you're trapped inside all right. the time. All right. So, you know, for people who um, uh, are, are accustomed to coming and going to one of our crowded bars at yeah. night for nightlife. It's that's a little tough, but you know, at night, if you want to go on a ghost tour, then you know, very good. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> we we got a lot of room to space and mm -hmm. and uh, get a little uh, PA system for the uh, tour guide so it projects a little bit further. Oh, okay, uh, that, that's able to wear on the belt, and so that uh, helps a little bit. And, uh, but yeah, it's, everybody's different. And I think for the people that have got cabin fever and, and uh, want to get out, uh, we have so many people that uh, make it a habit to come to Eureka right. once a year, a couple times a year. And uh, the, it's a little more personable. They may know their innkeepers where they're staying exactly. at. They, they have waiters or waitresses at, at different establishments or owners of mm -hmm. different businesses that they've uh, created a bit of a relationship to. And uh, I think a lot of the Eureka fans um, do appreciate that financially it's been really tough because so uh, much yeah. of our business is a mom and pop thing. We don't, we're not, a Huge. corporate, yeah, you're a, you're a private owner, a mom and pop, like you said, family businesses, and those are the ones that have really been hurt in this. And, and so Eureka, when you get a chance, so soft opening, say this Friday is what's Well, that? yeah, and yeah. We're, we're, we have people out and about. Um, I noticed there was a few more cars yeah. than I've seen the last, in the last month when I passed through here. Right. And, okay. So uh, it... You know, I, I would encourage people, come on a Tuesday or a Wednesday exactly. or a Thursday. Don't wait till Saturday to come because, I mean, if, if you have time during the week off and can get away, come, come during the week. And I always prefer to go do things on the weekday because I hate to say it, a lot of times they're not as crowded and right. um, I yeah. can see more things without jostling around. Well, and, and we have a, a little bit of a deterrent with limited parking anyway on it's the true. really busy time. And so I, there are, and there are some people who just love big groups and then there's others who just love really having the town for themselves and have no weight when they go exactly. to Exactly. And they can stroll around and, and even more so now, I think you're going to have people that are going to appreciate that. So. Uh, last time Gary and I were here, it was the Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras parade. And that was just, it was lovely. You know, yeah. it's not like New Orleans. It's not a long, r raucous affair, but it was really fun and friendly. And we had good food when we were here. So yeah. I like Eureka Springs to stay open. Yeah. Right. Well, well, Steve, it's been a pleasure talking with you. And... Look forward to your ghost tour. We'll take it. All right. Thanks a lot.